Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm looking forward to next week because I'm going to be back there in person with you all. And we're going to look forward to having a good time and having potluck and sharing together. So be sure to remind our local friends that uh, next week is our week for us to be together in person. I'm looking forward to that. Let's go ahead and begin our class with prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your love and for the way you have designed your universe and kingdom to run. We ask that your spirit will join us here this morning, enlighten our minds, uh, transform our hearts, make us effective in sharing this final message of mercy, the, the truth of your kingdom to the world that you might come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. We are doing lesson number three in the quarterly, God's Mission, My Mission. And the title this week is God's Call to Mission. And the memory verse is taken from Acts 1, 8, and it reads, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What power, what, what kind of power? From whom does the power come? What is the purpose of this power? When you read this, the power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we can say, okay, the power is going to come from the Holy Spirit. Are there conditions on receiving this power? What are those conditions? Do we want this power today? Is this power for us? Was it only for the people in the first century? Well, in the book, The Desire of Ages, the author makes comment on this power, and I find it quite interesting. See what you think of this. This is on page 672. It says, Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church, and the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. But like every other promise, it is given on conditions. There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise, they talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit, yet receive no benefit. They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in his people to will and do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. But many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift, only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace is the spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. First off, do you agree with this, or, or do you think this, this describes it incorrectly? You, you agree? Okay. Then what are the conditions to receive the Holy Spirit? I, I didn't hear you. Ask. Surrender. Surrender. Can you hear us? Surrender self. So what does that mean to surrender self? Surrender our selfishness, our self-promotion, our own agenda, our need to do things our way, our seeking to make ourselves successful, our plans, our purposes. Uh, when David wanted to build the temple, his desire to build the temple was not a bad thing, but it was his plan. It wasn't God's plan. He had to surrender that plan, even though it was a good plan. It was, his motive was good to love the Lord. It wasn't the plan that God had for him. He had to surrender the plan. We must be willing to be taught, to be led, to be instructed, guided, molded, reshaped, healed, cleansed, renewed. But what does it mean that the Holy Spirit uses us? Does that mean we become pawns, puppets, playthings, toys, disposable objects like a dish rag that, uh, you know, we use a dish rag, the dish rag doesn't use us? <laughs> no. 
Avenue. I mean, is that what it means that the Holy Spirit uses us like that? I've, I, I, you think I'm saying this tongue in cheek, but I'm not. This question comes up fairly regularly from people um, about when they read things that suggest that we are to be used by God. We don't use God. They actually interpret it along these lines that we then become pawns or puppets or or playthings or toys that God is just manipulating for His own pleasures. Is that what it means? He wants us to cooperate with Him to advance the kingdom. Yes, of course, absolutely. So to be used by God, though, what's, what is, how do we understand that language, to be used by the Holy Spirit? He can be a blessing to others. To bless others. That's, that's the purpose, yes, that's right. And can't you, can't a, a puppeteer use puppets, hand puppets or other puppets, to teach lessons, to be blessings to other people? Can't they do that? Can. So the fact that he uses us to be ble blessings doesn't doesn't really address the question of whether we're puppets or not. So it is. I agree with you. The purpose is to be a blessing for sure. Yeah. But what does it mean that he uses us? How can we correctly understand this? Is there is there some un underlying truth that we have to understand first before we can understand? what it means to be used by the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit uses us. Would it be necessary to first understand God's character, his methods, his yeah. principles, his design laws, how he functions and works? Then we can rightly understand what it means to be used. If we have the wrong concept of God's character, if we have the wrong methodology that God uses in our belief system about God, won't that lead us to conclude different things about what it means to be used by the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So when we understand the truth of God's character and his design laws, then we understand Romans 8, that God is for us, always for us. And he's always using his energies for the best of every person. God doesn't choose to lead in a person's life differently than that person would choose for themselves if they could sit on God's throne and see all the variables that God knows. Do you believe that to be true? Yes. Yes. You know, in the book Ministry of Healing, written by the same person who wrote The Desire of Ages, um, the author writes the following, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the purpose they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. This, this idea was quite impactful in my own life personally to recognize sometimes we face challenges, emotional distress, uh, issues that, that we don't see. But as I step back and realize, do I really believe God loves me? Do I really believe he wants better for me than I can actually choose for myself? Do I really believe that he knows variables that are beyond my awareness, future variables, other people's attitudes, uh, things in the environment that I don't even know about, that he then can in, uh, in, internalize and apply all those different variables to the circumstance that I can't even do? Do I really trust him with decisions like that? Or do I trust him if it goes down the path that I have concluded is really the best? And when I got this idea in my mind, I really believe that to be true. It took a lot of stress over the elements that I didn't personally have the, the final answer on yet. <clears throat> so God's use of us, as I understand it, is for our good, for our, our higher development, for our eternal life, for our ability to grow, mature, attain, fulfill, and eventually discern and be thankful to and for our amazing God who condescended to meet us in our ignorant childlike states and needs. And this is why the Bible says when we do surrender to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to use us to do exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life, we develop what are called fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, and 23, and the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and Self-control, not God control. We actually are restored to autonomy, to having greater self-determination and self-governance, but now we're making free will decisions in harmony with the methods, principles, and purposes of God because our hearts have been changed to share. And we know and we understand it makes perfect sense. It's much better to live in harmony with the way God built life. Why would I want to do it any other way? 
So we never become puppets. We are being used by the Holy Spirit, but we are always free. And the Holy Spirit frees us from fear, from, from selfishness, from addictions, from old destructive habits, frees us from the control and manipulation of other people and restores his living law of love within our hearts and minds that become the motivator to our free will decision making. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it, it is a different understanding of what it means to be used than how the world, if somebody says, I'm gonna use that person to do something, it's typically with a different methodology and a different understanding of what that means than when we understand God uses us. Let me ask you this, we're talking about the power, the power of the Holy Spirit that is still available for us today. Will God empower people to lie about him and misrepresent him? No. So if you're a Seventh-day Adventist or familiar with the Seventh-day Adventist church, have you ever wondered why the Seventh-day Adventist church preaches that they have a message that is to lighten the world, to hasten the second coming of Christ, a message given by Jesus himself, been by God, that, that when taken to the world will, will hasten the day, yet the second coming is delayed. It hasn't been hastened, it's been delayed. We have a message that will hasten, but yet we teach the message has been, the, the coming has been delayed. Is it possible that there has been a delay because the church leadership officially rejected the message that would hasten the day and replaced it with a fake message? And therefore, the power of the Spirit has been resisted by the church itself, and we're delayed. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who was at the 1888 General Conference, who wrote the Desire of Ages and Christ Object Lessons, uh, has written some very interesting things about what I just said. I'm gonna share her words, and you can decide whether you believe them or not. Everybody be per perfectly persuaded in, in their own mind, but, but this person is, is laying out a position with an explanation as to why there has been a delay and why the power of the Holy Spirit has been shut away from the church. You can agree or disagree, but let's look at the position. This is uh, from, let's see, third manuscript release, page 191. It says, when I purposed, this is Ellen White speaking, when I purposed to leave, the Minneapolis, leave Minneapolis, the general conference, the angel of the Lord stood by me and said, now I'm gonna pause right there. If you watch, the rest of what's following, it's in quotations, as she's quotating what she says the angel of the Lord told her. And you will identify, just as in scripture, the angel of the Lord is a euphemism for Jesus himself. Look in Exodus chapter three, and you will find the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush. And the angel of the Lord said, um, Take off your shoes, your own holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this is a euphemism for Christ. And you will notice in the quote that this angel claims to the people as his, and he's the source of grace. So this author is claiming that this message is actually coming from Jesus. Whether you believe it or don't believe it, understand setting a context for historical position on what happened to the Adventist church in 1888. So here's the quote, um, I, I, uh, the angel of the Lord stood by me as I was purposing to leave Minneapolis. Not so, God has a work for you to do in this place. The people are acting over, that means reenacting, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I have placed you in your proper position, which those who are not in the light will not acknowledge. They will not heed your testimony. What was Ellen White advocating at 1888? The healing view of the gospel promoted by Jones and Wagner, actual righteousness by faith. We become the righteous of God, not the legal fraud of declaring people righteous who are not righteous. Uh, in this recognition, they, un they advocated that the Ten Commandment law was an added law, it was not always in existence. They taught that this genuine restoration to righteousness 
which was also the healing of the heart and mind, the recreation of the inner man, the rebuilding of the temple, the cleansing of the bride. All these metaphors were the same as this position of becoming the righteousness of God, purifying the bride, preparing the church for Christ's return. But the church leadership rejected this healing view and chose instead to embrace the legal view that says, oh no, we aren't actually made righteous. We are not actually cleansed from sin. Our record books in heaven get cleansed from sin while we get declared legally righteous even though we remain unrighteous on earth. So we're unrighteous people with a legal um, declaration happening in the courtroom scene in heaven. This is what the church leadership embraced and said. And like Korah, they rejected the manna, which is heavenly bread of truth, choosing and preferring the flesh pots of Egypt, which are the worldly systems and methods, in this case, the penal legal system of salvation. This is according to the angel of the Lord, like Korah saying, we can't succeed, we can't, we can succeed in going to, we can't succeed in going to the promised land. Korah says, you can't go, it's too much, don't go over there, don't have faith, don't trust. We can't succeed in being righteous. We can't succeed in having our hearts renewed. We can't actually go into the heavenly promised land. This is what the church leadership is saying. The church leaders prefer the imperial law view, telling Adventists that, that ever since uh, we can't succeed in experiencing the righteousness of Christ, it's too great for us. God can't give us the power to be victorious in our lives so, we will be, uh, so that we'll be prepared to stand when he comes in his presence. No, we only get legal declaration while we remain unrighteous and have to hide behind Jesus to protect us from his father. That's the message our church took forward. Continuing on with this quote, this is again the angel of the Lord speaking. But I will be with you. My grace and power shall sustain you. It is not you they are despising, but the messengers and the message I send to my people. And I want to say this to our friends of common reason around the world. Realize that if you are presenting this message of God's design law, the truth of his character, the healing love of God, and you find that you're not being positively received in your local congregation, you're being rejected, recognize they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus Christ, just like the 1888 leadership did. Continuing on with the quote. They have shown contempt for the word of the Lord. Satan has blinded their eyes and perverted their judgment. And unless every soul shall repent of their sin, this unsanctified independence that is doing insult to the spirit of God, uh, they will walk in darkness. I will remove the candlestick out of his place, except they repent and be converted, that I should heal them. Notice that I should heal them. They have obscured their spiritual eyesight <clears throat> by refusing the truth of God's design law, by upholding the Roman imperial system of legal adjustment and imposed law with inflicted punishment for the ruling authority. They have blinded themselves to how reality works and live in a religious legal fantasy of confusion and contradictions mirroring this world with a God who is the source of pain, suffering, and death, and they call it justice. And this is what is being taught. This is why we're wandering in the wilderness. And if they persist in teaching this, they will become blind and incapable of seeing the truth or leading others into the promised land. And the SDA church has been wandering in the wilderness for over 135 years. God is waiting for a people to return to worship him as creator, and then his spirit will empower them to lighten the world. Continuing on with the quote, they would not that God should, they would not that God should manifest his spirit and his power, for they have a spirit of mockery and disgust at my word. This is again the angel of the Lord speaking. Not that they have a mockery at what Ellen White was saying. The angel of the Lord is saying they're mocking the message coming from God. This was the leadership of the church. Lightness, trifling, jesting, and joking uh, are daily practice. They have not set their hearts to seek me. Again, notice that the angel Lord is the one that says they should be seeking him. So this is really, again, Jesus speaking here, at least according to this author. They walk in the sparks of their own kindling, and unless they repent, they shall lie down in sorrow, thus says the Lord. And then a second quote, which is out of First Selected Messages 235, also describing these same events, the same author writes the following. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth, the truth that the Ten Commandments were added and righteousness by faith is something we actually experience. We become righteous. They, this was rejected. Lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through the uh, brethren Wagner and Jones. By exciting the opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people 
in a great measure, the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining the efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world. As the apostles proclaimed it in the day of Pentecost, the light that is to lighten the whole world with its glory was resisted. And by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. So I have a hypothesis that I'm putting before you that we have a message, the truth about God, his character of love, his design law, worshiping the creator, rejecting the Romanization of Christianity, uh, that this message when embraced by the people will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to carry it forward. And the reason that the organization has not carried this message forward, that there has been a delay, is because the leadership took the role of Korah, Dathan, and Byram, rejected the special message, and the Holy Spirit has been shut away from the, the people to a great degree by the false legal system of theology that is being taught in our school systems, in our publications, in our quarterlies, and continues to infect the minds and hearts of people who claim to be part of this group. What are your thoughts about that? Do you think I've overstated it from these documents? No. So what are the conditions for us to receive the Holy Spirit today? First, as individuals, we must surrender and have our own hearts, minds, and souls and spirits cleansed from our own self-aggrandizement and self-centeredness and fear. We must be willing to be transformed, reborn, recreated, to be like Jesus in our own motives and desires, loving God and loving people. I want to take a message that will heal them. We must be willing to be corrected, to give up wrong ideas and replace them with eternal truths, the eternal gospel, be lovers of the truth, not lovers of creeds or fundamental beliefs or doctrinal statements or other people's opinions or, or some office that we're holding or position in some organization. And we must know and be willing to share the truth of God's character of love and his design laws to the, to the world. And, and I think these are the conditions. And when, when we meet these conditions, we'll, we will experience the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. Now, I must take a moment and discuss the process of what I just did. The reason I must discuss the process is because invariably I will receive emails this week expressing dissatisfaction with me, suggesting that I have been attacking the church suggesting that I'm embittered or that I have sour grapes uh, from previous mistreatment that I've gone through, that I'm being negative and that I should instead focus on the positive and lift up Jesus and stop being so critical of the errors in the system. But let me be clear, I am not against the Seventh-day Adventist church any more than Jesus and the apostles were against the Jewish people and the Jewish nation 2000 years ago. I love the church like Jesus and the apostles love the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. They were against the lies that had infected the system that prevented the people from recognizing and embracing the Messiah. Likewise, I am against the lies that have infected the system and corrupted the beautiful truths that we should be teaching. I'm not against the church in any way. And I'm using, hopefully, the sword of the spirit, the, the truth, to expose the lies, to, carter, to cut out these lies out of the hearts and minds of the of the people and out of the system so that we can receive the latter rain and fulfill our purpose and mission. Amen. Any questions about that? No. Amen. Amen. Sunday's lesson, it says uh, in the first paragraph, in order to reach others, God intends for us to move beyond our comfort zone. The desire to remain only with our own ilk and ethnic or social kind can lead to selfishness, even evil. This danger is one of the lessons derived from the story of, of Babel, Tower of Babel. Do you see a problem with this paragraph? There is a serious problem with this paragraph. Do you see it? It misdiagnoses or misplaces the problem. This is the sentence that you should really hone in on. The desire to remain only with one's ilk and ethnic or social kind can lead to selfishness, even evil. But it's the reverse. It is fear and selfishness that lead to sectarianism, uh, prejudices, biases, and all these other divisions that uh, denigrate other people. We are born in sin, conceived in iniquity, Psalms 51. 
This is the carnal nature, the me first orientation that drives us to, to violate God's law of love for other people. It, it is selfishness that is the problem. And selfishness is not, when it's not replaced in our heart as the primary motivator with love for God and others, which occurs when we were born, if that doesn't happen, then we invariably divide into various identity groups that make us feel good about ourselves. And we find others that we can denigrate and project our own flaws upon and our own self-satisfaction upon. And then we seek, instead of hating the evil within our own hearts, we justify the evil in our own hearts by hating it in others that we see and denigrate. And this leads to the divisions that we have in society. So. I think the primary problem is the sin in the heart that causes the division, right. not the divisions causing the sin in the heart. Amen. Amen. So humans divide, we always divide. And if we're not dividing on ethnic or other so, uh, groups, then we divide on other things. We'll divide on nationality. Remember, nation states are artificial, yet people will identify with their nation and pit themselves against other people from other nationalities and see the other people as less valuable or worthy because they're not of their nation. Sports teams, have you seen, have you noticed uh, violence and hostility uh, happening when people root for a different team? How about gangs? Consider how gangs divide and make up their artificial standards that members must meet to join. Or political parties. Do you notice how society divides along political parties? None of this is ethnics or or uh, it is simply artificial division. Humans divide because we have selfishness and fear in our hearts. And we want to divide in order to somehow gain more power and security for ourselves. So that's what sin does, sin divides. But at the Tower of Babel, they were united. The sinful rebels against God were united. They weren't divided. Why were they united if sin divides? Because they had a common enemy and it was God. I don't know who said that, but you're exactly correct. Because they perceived a common enemy, a common threat. They were afraid of another flood. They didn't trust God. And thus they joined themselves together in common cause to protect themselves from their same common enemy, which is God himself. You can see the same thing happening today when an existential, some overwhelming threat presents itself. People who were fighting against each other suddenly unite to face the common threat together. And it's still fear motive, self motive, protection motive, power motive. It's not love motive. So we see the Tower of Babel. People were motivated by fear, by selfishness, and identified God as the enemy threat and united against the source of life. So what did God do when they united together against him? Genesis 11, 6 through 8. This is from the NIV. Notice what, what, what it says. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their languages so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over the earth and they stopped building the city. What does it mean that if they had begun to do this speaking the same language that nothing they planned would be impossible for them. Let's, let's, let's address that question first. The Bible says that, that if they were united with the same language, then nothing they planned to do would be impossible for them. Does that mean that if united they planned to become angels, that they would then become angels? If they plan to create a new planet and 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 have and and move to a new planet off of the planet Earth, would would they be able to do that no. if that's what they planned? No. No. Does it mean that if they plan to become God themselves that they could become God? No. Does it mean that if their men plan to become women that their men could actually become women? <laughs> <laughs> because the same corrupt concepts are happening today. Exactly. So the text doesn't mean they could actually do anything they plan because they cannot do anything they plan because there are actual limitations on their abilities and what they can actually achieve. So I think the text does not mean they could do anything. I think the context of the, of the text tells us what it means. What, what, 
what were they doing? They were rejecting God's word and they were rebelling against him in distrust and sin and selfishness. And so I think the text means that if they continue to rebel against heaven and us, that there is no evil that they plan to do that they won't carry out. They will carry out every evil they plan. There's nothing, there's nothing evil that they won't be able to do. That's what I think it really is talking about. Quite, next question, why did God confuse their languages? So they wouldn't be able to understand it. Introduce division. To introduce a certain form of division, that's right. Because what just happened on planet Earth? Prior to, the, prior to the flood, the human race, having one language from Eden, had just united in selfishness. And every single human except Noah and his family hardened their hearts against God in heaven. And the avenue for the Messiah, Genesis 3.15 promise, was almost closed. God acted in mercy to keep open the avenue for Jesus to come and save humanity by sending the flood. But all, immediately after the, after the flood, God, even though God promises he would never do this again, he tells them to disperse across the earth, stop uniting in a single group to rebel against heaven. I need to keep open the plan of salvation. That's the Messiah needs him. Instead, they unite again in distrust and rebellion against God. So God mercifully and therapeutically confused their languages to prevent another worldwide, worldwide rejection of him and the hardening of all human hearts in order to slow the spread of evil and sin and keep open the avenue for Messiah. And the Bible says that the people of the world will not be fully united again against heaven as they were at the time of the flood until the final events that lead the whole world in the beastly system to war against heaven, all the world wonders after the beast. That's when they unite, and that's the beast described in Revelation 17, when it says the beast which you saw once was, it existed at one time in history, it's not now, it's not, it doesn't exist right now, and it will come up out of the abyss to go to its destruction, but it's gonna come again in the future. This beast represents the worldwide coalition of all human forces in rebellion against God, except for the righteous like Noah and his family, which existed prior to the flood, hasn't existed since the flood, but will exist again right before Jesus comes. And this, this system of rebellion will also be destroyed just like the first one was in the flood. So why did Jesus confuse, confuse the languages? To keep open the avenue for some Messiah and spread and slow the spread of sin and evil. It was an act of love and mercy. The Bible is clear that it was at the Tower of Babel that God confused the languages. And I have concluded that it was also at that time that God introduced what we see as the physiological racial differences with different heights, hair, eye colors, eye shape, skin colors, and so forth to help divide society to prevent this unified rebellion against he heaven. The Adventist Bible commentary seems to agree with my position, and I'm going to say my position. They had it; they put it before me. I just didn't read it, so maybe I'm agreeing with them. But we agree, and this is from the Adventist Bible commentary. By confusing their la the la their language and thus forcing them to separate, God designed to forestall future united action. Each of the groups might yet pursue an evil course, but the division of society into many groups would prevent concerted opposition to God. Upon repeated occasions since this dispersion of the races at Babel, so they're inferring it wasn't just languages that there were dispersion of races here. Ambitious men have sought unsuccessfully to contravene the divine decree of separation. Evidence from many lands testifies to the presence of human beings with a comparatively short time after the flood. Archaeological discoveries point to the Mesopotamian Valley as the first locality to develop a distinct civilization. Similar civilizations sprang up soon afterwards in Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Anatolia, India, China, and elsewhere. Again, notice different racial groups in different places of the world. All available evidence supports the cryptic saying of the Holy Writ that the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. 
So God divided humanity in mercy to prevent the human race from uniting in sin and rebellion against heaven for the purpose of keeping open avenue for Messiah to save the human race. And the Bible tells us that only when Jesus is put back at the center do these divisions ultimately resolve themselves. And in Revelation 7, 9, it says, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people in the language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And so eventually these divisions are reversed and we have one unified humanity that we become one as God and Jesus are one, that we are in them and they are in us and we are all united. But that unity of the race only happens when Jesus is at the center. Any questions about that? No. The last paragraph in the quarterly says, through those scripture does not say it explicitly. Ellen White says that they didn't trust God's promise that he would never destroy the earth again with water. They intended to build for their own perceived safety rather than to trust God's word. Whatever their ultimate motives, God knew that their intentions were not pure, but were filled with selfish ambition. And so he prevented them from achieving their stated goals. This beast that existed before the flood the Bible tells us uh, will exist again when Jesus comes. The people after the flood were uniting again against heaven because they didn't believe God's promise to never destroy the world again with, with, by water with a flood. What about today? Will a similar lie be used to unite the world against heaven today? Do you see the same disbelief distrust of God and his promise made right after the flood, uniting the world in rebellion against God today. Well, this is Genesis 8:22. Look at the promise given right after the flood. This is not the rainbow one. It's right adjacent to the rainbow one. He gave another promise. Here it is. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God made a promise about our climate. In the pro, it, 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 it's a promise that until he recreates, until the earth is destroyed at the second coming, our climate, our seasons, our harvest, our, our, our seed time and planting, all of it will continue. It will not be disrupted. Understand how, is there a message going out today that denies this promise? Yeah, is there a, is there, is the world, are the nation states uniting around a, 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 a worldview, a narrative that actually denies this promise? Yes. yes. Understand how evil people and evil angels work. <coughs> they identify some threat that you cannot see, touch, taste, feel, hear, or identify by any means that God has given you to identify it, such as the climate is changing. (laughs) Understand, there is nothing you can do to measure that, see that, discern that, feel that, nothing. They they then bombard you with propaganda from all sources of, of, of society, expert opinion, uh, meteorologists, news outlets, politicians, all sources of society, academia, promote the lie the false narrative. And then they take unrelated events and claim those events are due to climate change, such as a heat wave or a hurricane or a fire. Mm. Then they make decisions that artificially create consequences that they attribute to the climate change, like shutting down our production of oil, which raises energy costs and decreases the production of fertilizers, which then decrease the production of crops, making food costs and energy costs go higher and have shortages of some of these things in various parts of the world, which results in the mega rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. But it is alleged that all this is happening because of climate change. We can't grow crops the way we used to. No, you've shut off the production of the fertilizers that would allow us to do it. All of this increases fear in the people who believe the lie that it is all happening because of climate change. So they go along with other artificial uh, interventions that are claimed to stop climate change that have no evidence of impacting the climate in a positive way at all, like 
new light bulbs and different straws and, and different things like this. And the only evidence that those things do is take money out of the pocket of the people and put it in the pocket of the corporate elites who are making these new products. Just like COVID, it's a big thing. Yes. See how today, worldwide, the nation states are uniting on climate change lies because they reject God, they reject God's promise, and they are using fear to exploit, dominate, enslave, and control the masses. And Jesus said, these are Jesus' words now in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it would be at the coming of the Son of Man. Despite Noah's preaching of the impending flood for 120 years and building of an ark that any of them could have seen, the people, according to Jesus, didn't know what was coming. They didn't understand. They didn't recognize. They were unaware. How is that even possible that they were unaware when he's preaching for 120 years? They're thinking. Because they accepted a false narrative and rejected the message of truth coming from God. If you live back to Noah's day with your current belief in the Bible and God, who would you have believed? Noah or the media and scientific experts of the day? Well, what about today with your current belief in God and the Bible? Who are you believing? Are you believing the Bible and the promise of God that our seasons and climate will not change until the second coming? Or are you believing all the experts and media propaganda and living in fear that the climate is gonna be changed and going along with all the propaganda? Jesus said something similar would happen in our day. At his second coming approaches, people are unaware of it. And why are they unaware? because they believe the lie that there's no God. They believe that we evolved from lower life forms. They believe the earth is being overpopulated. They believe that we must save ourselves. We must build our own tower into heaven. But this tower is not made with bricks. It's made with our own ingenuity and science. We must control the climate and we must uh, uh, fix our, our failing planet. We must, just like the antediluvians, decide who we're going to believe, the Bible, God's word, or the godless evolutionist pundits of the world who control the narrative that you're getting fed in all of the media outlets of the world. The same people who brought us the COVID mandates and took our liberties and, and coerced our consciences and injured our children. The same people who want to tell you that children without parental consent can get gender reassignment surgery and parents shouldn't be involved. These are the same people. We are not facing a global climate disaster. We are facing a global spiritual disaster. Amen. We are not facing man-made global warming. We are facing man-made global coldness of heart. Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. Amen. Matthew 12, at the end of time. Love is being extinguished from the hearts. People are becoming more narcissistic, self-centered, exploited, abusive. Satan blinds people to reality by getting them to focus on something emotional, some distraction, so they don't even understand or recognize the reality around them, just like the people that died in the flood, did not see the truth, even though it was being preached to them. Yeah. Satan's end time push is active and aggressive and it turns minds away from God, away from the Bible, away from the hope of a new heaven and an earth to a future in which we are supposedly going to destroy ourselves through overpopulation and climate disaster. And he offers the false solution that we must save ourselves through activities that actually harm the people. And the many, many various solutions proposed by the so-called green movement actually are anti-human, anti-science, anti-liberty, are pro-elite designed to enslave the masses for the benefit of the elite while they destroy health and healthy living. Amen. All right, so questions about that.
And some people think I'm being political. I'm not being political any more than Jesus was in Matthew 24. I'm help, helping you see the reality in which we live. God has made promises, and those promises are being denied by the elites. And many, many Christians that I know are caught up in this elite fear of what's happening in the climate. And they go along with policies and practices that actually cause the problems that the so-called pundits are claiming that they're going to deliver us from. We have to have discernment and understand the reality and the creation as God designed it and our role and where we stand in history so we don't get caught up in it. Amen. Comments, questions? Monday's lesson focuses on our, uh, our attention on the focal point of the Bible, the most important text in Scripture in my view. Uh, at least in the Old Testament scripture, and that text is in Genesis 3.15, where God, speaking to the serpent, says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, I will put, uh, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This passage sets the stage and the context for understanding the entire Bible narrative. Everything recorded in the Old Testament is fulfillment of this promise, the war between God and Satan. God is working to stop the fulfillment. This is why we see the flood. God is keeping open avenue for Messiah. This is why we see the confused language, same reason. This is why the Bible shortly thereafter focuses on Abraham uh, and the promises made to Abraham. And understand, the promises made to Abraham are not new promises. They are the continuation of the Genesis 3.15 promise. The seed will crush the serpent's head. It's that same seed, that same individual, that same Messiah. We just now have narrowed down the, the human family tree to this particular branch of the human family. And we narrow it down from not all of Abraham's children to the children through Isaac, not Ishmael, and the children through Jacob, not Esau, and the children through Judah, not through the other 11 tribes, because this is the focus of Scripture. And notice through history, the Bible writers keep narrowing, 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 and we're focusing now on the tribe of Judah, because that's where Jesus comes. This is the whole focus of Scripture. And then after Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension, the Bible continues to focus on the plan of salvation, which is the work of Jesus as our heavenly high priest being carried forward by the messengers of the gospel, which were Jews who became Christians, and then the converted Christians who take this message forward. And this is what Bible prophecy then focuses on, where the gospel message is going forward, and it no longer fo focuses on the nation state of Israel, because they aren't carrying the message forward anymore. Any questions about that? Yes. It really? Yes. Go ahead. If God had seen that it was not Abraham but a Chinese gentleman in China, then we would be studying about China's uh, history and and the Messiah could have been Chinese. Hundred percent. Yes. The whole purpose of the scripture was the fulfillment of John, G Genesis 3.15, the coming Messiah. And it was the focus of scripture through history is on that plan of salvation being carried out ultimately through the branch of the human family. So if a Chinese individual would have been Abraham, would have been the person whom had faith and through whom God in his foreknowledge would work to bring the Messiah, then the whole Bible would be uh, written in, in their language and would and the whole history would be about the people and the family for whom those promises were achieved and Jesus would have been born there. And that's what we would see and the prophecies would coordinate with the life that he would have lived there, would have been born in some other city than Bethlehem and so forth. Well, I'm glad it didn't happen that way. Because I, I can't read Chinese. <laughs> it would be but, I, I can't read Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek either, so. Are you saying then that God did not choose Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham chose God, and because Abraham had chosen God, God reciprocated. Of course not. Uh, it was a mutual choice. God chose Abraham because he saw in Abraham and looking down the quarters of time, the future events that were going to unfold, God saw that he could fulfill his promise through the family of Abraham. Does that mean there were no other families? I don't know. We don't have that information. We aren't told that God looked through 338,000 different families, and this is the one that he was going to be able to work through his principles of truth, love, and freedom, and uh, to ultimately navigate things 
to the ultimate conclusion. We don't know if other families were considered or not by God, but I see God looking down the corridors of time and seeing exactly how things would unfold and understood that Abraham would be faithful and loyal and his descendants would be the one. And this is why Abraham was chosen, but Abraham also had to choose God. If Abraham doesn't choose God, then God's not gonna choose Abraham. So it's a mutual decision. Good, good. Yeah, that's true yeah, too. Good questions. Tuesday's lesson focuses on Abraham's call and how uh, when he initially arrived in his new land, he lied to Pharaoh and Abimelech about Sarah being his sister and not disclosing that Sarah was his wife. You've, and this, you know, as, as you've often heard, is the whitest of white lies because Sarah was in fact his half-sister. So it wasn't a false statement to say that she was his sister. It was a false statement to present her as sister and not as wife. And that was what the false statement was. And why did Abraham do this? What was his reason? Fear. Selfish. Fear. Selfish. 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 Both answers, correct. Yes, he was afraid, and fear drives us towards Selfish. selfishness, self-protection. Where, when and where did Abraham get his heart and mind infected with fear and selfishness? When did that happen for Abraham? I didn't hear it. He was born with it. That's right. Recognize this. Uh, I'm going to tell you, so many people and patients I deal with do not realize that. Their systems tell them that they are sinners because they have sinned. No. They're sinners because they were born in sin and conceived in iniquity. I would like you to tell me anybody that you know that chose to become a sinner. <laughs> None of us had an option to not be sinners. We were born in sin. Adam and Eve had that option. And Jesus, as our Savior, had that option. He chose not to be a sinner all the way through. Adam and Eve didn't. We are born in sin, conceived in iniquity. Our option is, we never had an option not to be sinners. Our option is very simple and straightforward. We can be reborn into a righteous life through the gift of Jesus Christ. We can partake of what he has provided to free us or deliver us from sin, but we don't have a, a choice to ever live a life that was never a sinner. And this is very important recognition. So he had this condition, and this is what we learned from him. He was born in sin, conceived in iniquity. He has faith in God. He goes to, the, leaves his land, goes to a new land, but that faith yet in his life did not free him from the stumblings and mistakes that the sin condition tempted it into. At least in these two occasions, he failed to exercise faith in God and acted to protect himself by lying and putting his wife in a very bad position. God was gracious and God intervened to protect Sarah in those circumstances. But then God did something more. He did something very, very powerful and very, very special for Abraham. What did he do and why did he do it? <laughs> Well, of course, God brought a promised son. That, that was a very special thing, a very, a very special blessing allowed Abraham, uh, excuse me, allowed Sarah's infertility. Get your mind around this. Abraham did not have a fertility problem. Remember, he already had Ishmael. Sarah had a fertility problem, the physical health problem. God, at appropriate age, resolved that and healed this fertility problem. And Abraham, through the natural course of human relationships, had a child with Sarah. And this is the same for all of the miracle births you see in scripture. All the miracle births were women with fertility problems, except for Mary. Mary was a different, she was a virgin. This was a different type of miracle birth. All the others were physiological problems of human biology and, and, and infertility that God healed. And then those women got pregnant in the normal way men and women or women get pregnant. It was not God acting to cause a pregnancy. He just healed their fertility problem. So that's what happened here. And then God, and then he had the promised son. And then God does something very special for Abraham, very powerful, but very special. What does he do? He tells Abraham to sacrifice the promised son. That's what he did. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. And why would God do this for Abraham? Or you may say, do this to Abraham. Do you do it to him or for him? For him. 
He did it for him. Why did he do it for him? What did God want for Abraham? What does he want for you? What does he want for me? Complete trust. The complete trust in him, which means freedom from the control of fear and selfishness. He wants us to have new hearts and right spirits who can live in complete trust to him. Abraham, while he had enough faith to leave his home, demonstrates by the two lies that he told that he didn't have quite yet the maturity of faith to stand in the face of fear and insecurity. So he takes matters into his own hands on a couple of occasions to try to manipulate ends to his own ends, etc. So he still had room to mature and grow. This test with Isaac was his opportunity not to sacrifice Isaac, but to ultimately exercise his faith and trust in God and overcome his own fear and self-scheming. This is what it was what it was all about. And so that's the first reason that Abraham needed to mature in faith. And we find this in James chapter 2, starting in verse 20. The first reason God did this, and this is James. You fool, do you, want to, do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see? His faith and his actions worked together. His faith was made perfect through his actions. And the scripture came true that said Abraham believed God and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. You see then that it is by people's actions that they are put right with God, not by their faith alone. Wait a second, isn't that contrary to the entire tenor of the Protestant Reformation? It is by faith alone. This is why Martin Luther rejected the book of James. He did not believe James was inspired. But James is exactly correct. When you understand design, when you have a legal system of artificial adjustment and legal inflicted penalties, then you just have faith in the judge who will then accept a payment in your behalf and declare you to be righteous. There's no work you have to do. But when you have design law and you understand that the actual salvation is healing the heart and mind, eradicating fear and selfishness and establishing um, truth and love in the being, and to do that it cannot override your individuality, it requires your cooperation or else God would erase you as the person you are, replace you with another if you're not cooperative in the process. God won't do that. Then you understand that when we're restored to faith, we must choose with our own freedom of choice to apply that faith in the actions we make in governance of ourselves. We don't have the strength to succeed with our own strength, but we have to choose the truth with our own choice. And then we receive the strength from God to succeed, but the choice is ours. And that's what it means. So if you were sick with pneumonia and the doctor gave you an antibiotic that would cure you 100% and you have faith in the doctor and you believe the antibiotic will help you, so you believe the truth here, but you put the antibiotic on the shelf and never take it, does your faith or believe in the doctor and the antibiotic do you any good if you won't apply it? No. That's what James is saying. Unless you actually apply the truth, the love to your life in action, then it doesn't actually have saving faith for you. So the first reason God really wanted Abraham to be healed in heart and mind, and he put him in position where Abraham had to actually trust the future, the outcome, his son's life, his most precious thing to God himself, rather than seeking to do it his own way. That was the first reason. The second reason God did this Jesus tells us the second reason God gave this gift, and this was a gift to Abraham. It was actually an answer to Abraham's prayer. You'll find this in John chapter 8, verse 56, where Jesus said to the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. What do you think that's referring to? It's referring to what happened in Mount Moriah when the father offers up his son for the sacrifice and he saw that a substitute was going to come and uh, he even said that, that God would provide a substitute. So Abraham longed to know God more intimately, to understand God's character and plan of salvation, to comprehend and see the Savior. 
God uh, therefore instructed Abraham to sacrifice Isaac as a means not only to help Abraham overcome his fear and selfishness, but as an answer to Abraham's prayer to allow Abraham to personally experience a closer connection and empathy and compassion and knowledge of what Godhead was going to go through in the sacrifice of Jesus. And so Abraham saw the day of Christ and rejoiced in it and was thankful. The third reason God instructed Abraham to sacrifice Isaac was as a demonstration or a witness to the intelligences in heaven, the sinless angels who cannot read the secret hearts or the secrets of hearts and minds. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, that I think God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle, a theater to the world, both to angels and to men. And the apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of things that have, have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Angels cannot read the secrets of the hearts and minds of people. If angels could read secrets of hearts, none of the angels would have been deceived by Lucifer in heaven. They cannot. That's right. Therefore, God must demonstrate that his methods actually work. Just as he did in the case of Job, Satan in heaven before God and the angels makes allegations against Abraham, claiming that Abraham lied and broke trust with God by misrepresenting Sarah as his sister rather than his wife, that Abraham really doesn't have faith in God. Abraham really isn't trustworthy. Abraham isn't really on God's side. Abraham just pretends to get the benefits he can, but at the end of the day, he only trusts himself and he'll do it his way. So a third reason God put this challenge before Abraham was not only for Abraham's opportunity to be free of the, the fear and selfishness in his heart, not only as an opportunity to empathize and know God and what God was going through, but as a witness to demonstrate to the angels, see, I told you my ways work. When people spend time with me, when they come to know me, when they love me and value my methods, their hearts are changed and they stop acting in fear and selfishness and they start living in love and trust. There's a quotation from the book, Patriarchs of Prophets, that kind of describes this. Page 154, it says, the sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and other worlds. The field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promise, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy of its blessing. God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. So it's the third reason. And there's a fourth reason why God, so if you ever had this, why would God tell Abraham to, to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah? Why would he do it? I'm giving you three reasons for Abraham's overcoming of the fear and selfishness. Uh, uh, for Abraham to empathize and to know more fully what God was going to do and to see the plan of salvation. For Abraham to be a witness and testimony of the unfallen beings. And one more reason to demonstrate that human sacrifice is not what God wants, nor what God accepts. Because God, while he gave the instruction for these reasons, God refused to allow it to be carried forth and would not accept a human sacrifice to appease him. And we find this truth in other places in the Old Testament, like Micah 6, 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings that with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord, does, Lord requires of you to act justly and to love mercy yeah. and to walk humbly with your God. So it's such a powerful story of what God called Abraham to do. And, it, and, and God reveals so many elements that he simultaneously weaves together in the same action for the benefit of Abraham, 
for the, for the blessing of Abraham, for the benefit of the unlooking universe, and for the benefit of all of us who've come since then. Multiple reasons. And you will find this in many of the stories of Scripture, that God is weaving together multiple purposes and blessings for the people who, who follow along. Questions about any of that? All right, let's go ahead and close with prayer and then we'll do our Q&A time. Take a short break in Q&A. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you have provided us the lesson book of scripture, the history of uh, that you have had recorded there for us to reflect upon, ultimately all of it pointing forward to Jesus. And we are so thank you, thankful, Jesus, for what you have accomplished in our behalf. We ask now that your spirit will take your victory, reproduce it in us, that we might be transformed like Abraham was to live life faith, not based off of fear and self-seeking. We pray in your holy name. Amen.